Welcome to Cream, Eggs and Jam. A podcast for food nerds with show and tell by Elise Bullbrook and Scott Bagnell. We love to cook with cream, eggs and jam and learn from food people who give a damn. So join us each week for thoughts, tips and tricks with guests, recipes and more in the mix. Woohoo! Episode two, Scotty. (laughs) Episode two. Welcome, everybody. We made it. We're not a one trick wonder. We've made it to episode two. (laughs) This is exciting. And for those who haven't listened before, hi, I'm Elise Spillbrook. It's nice to have you with us today. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country. And I'm Scott Bagnell and I'm coming to you today from Yuggera country. And we'd like to start our podcast today by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land in which we're recording and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, we have an apology to make. We do. (laughs) Yes. Yes. (laughs) During episode one, we alluded to a potential uh, uh, travel and uh, we said we were going to Paris for episode two. We may have got <laughs> a little bit excited. We may have jumped the gun and, uh, and look, it hasn't happened. Uh, we're not in no. Paris today. We wish Some we might. were. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say the sponsorship fell through. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, that was definitely a problem. But, you know, look, I think we're embracing Paris today. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, you will see this amazing beret that uh, Elise is wearing and matching scarf. We're dressed for the part today, so we feel like we're in Paris. I love this beret. Thank you. I love it too. It was actually sent to me in the mail by a lovely lady named Josephine, who is the lady behind mm. the Mocha Master uh, coffee machine brand. Yes. And look at this box that it came in. Oh, look. my God, that is beautiful. It's like this round hat box, but it's thin. Like, oh, that's so nice. Yes. And then when you open the lid, it has the most gorgeous design. Oh, cute. Look at that. That's amazing. Mm. It's like um, graffiti and it includes illustrations of women wearing berets. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I love this. I did have a beret, but I have no – I've turned the house upside down. I have no idea where it is. So I'm wearing a lovely scarf today. It's a beautiful 27 degrees in Brisbane today. (laughs) It's not really (laughs) scarf weather, but I am just – I'm in the zone. I'm pretending that it's lovely and cool and I'm in Paris Mm. looking at the opera. Oh, looking at the opera house. That's Sydney. (laughs) Looking at the (laughs) opera tower. Oh, no. Yes, 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 Um, yes, yes. We're um, sitting at Angelina's and enjoying one of the most luxurious hot chocolates that you could (sighs) enjoy anywhere in the world. It's thick, it's decadent and... It is perfect for the cool weather. That is where Mm. we are, really, in spirit. (laughs) In spirit, we are in Paris. And this Mm. week we're talking about French foods, hence why we're in theme today, because the episode on Sunday that's just gone of MasterChef, it was an elimination episode. Well, it should have been, but they tricked Mm. us. They Mm. wheeled out Shannon Bennett and they had a surprise service challenge and they had to cook French food. Food. Now, French food is really hard. I think a few of the contestants were a bit thrown by French food because it is such a classic cuisine and you need it's all based on technique and simplicity. And I think in the MasterChef kitchen, it is really hard to exercise restraint. You've got so many things in your head. You've been practicing so many recipes and ideas. You just want to get them all out and you want to wow the judges with a lot of stuff. Um, so being able to edit and exercise that restraint and present a dish that is so simple, um, I think you could tell a lot of the contestants were struggling with, um, and and look, I don't think we eat a lot of French food. I definitely don't. I love it. It's very luxurious. Um, I am lactose intolerant, so, um, there's a lot of butter that goes into French cuisine, (laughs) What about you? Do you eat a lot of French cuisine? No, Scotty. It's not a cuisine that I naturally gravitate to as a cook. Uh, However, I do agree that French food is largely about technique. I disagree that French food is all about 
butter. I have the good fortune to meet with Tim White from Books for Cooks to discuss yeah. French cuisine. And the books he showed me about provincial cooking prove that in the southern region of France, olive oil is the preferred fat. And dear listener, you'll be able to hear from Tim later in this podcast. Someone who absolutely nailed technique and the composition of a French dish was Mel. And um, Mel is a contestant on this season's MasterChef and she is also the very first guest to our podcast, Miss Melanie Person. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Hello. Mel, thank you so much. Um, (laughs) First of all, I would love for you to introduce yourself as a human beyond the world of MasterChef. You are a contestant on this year's season, but I would love for our listeners to know who you are outside of that uh, competitive cooking show. Um, (laughs) Do I exist outside of MasterChef at the moment? I'm not sure. Um, I am (laughs) a... (laughs) I'm Mel and I'm a PhD candidate in the field of children's literature and I live in Perth with my partner Lucy and our two little dogs. The fact that you're studying children's literature, it just gives me goosebumps and I just I just want to, I don't know, why aren't you my neighbour and why don't we have tea every day? <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, not a common response to the children's lit. Um, <laughs> why a fascination with children's literature? Oh, Mel, I really want to write a kid's book. Uh, we will discuss this another time. Okay. And, it, it's not, and it's not just I want to, like I have all these drawings and ideas, but we, will, we can discuss this another time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so, French food. Yes. Yeah. This Sunday's um, elimination that's just happened – on MasterChef, we had Shannon Bennett in the kitchen for a French service challenge. They're really mixing it up this season on MasterChef, aren't they? Like, usually Sunday's an elimination, then all of a sudden it's a service challenge. Shannon Bennett's in the house and it's French food. <laughs> what a crazy challenge. How did you find it? <laughs> I think they're just trying to keep us on our toes, you know, not knowing what to expect in any given day. Um, the French challenge, I, I was just kind of along for the ride, I think, for that one. I, I really, um, <laughs> uh, French cooking's not something that's like super comfortably in my repertoire. I mean, I think I gravitated straight to the dessert team because I was like, well, most desserts, yes. to be fair, come from some version of French food. So I was like, you know, that's probably where I can, um, contribute most. But, uh, yeah, it was lucky that they took me on in that on that course. Otherwise, I would have been completely lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're an amazing dessert chef. You make some incredible food. I was impressed with your choux pastry, choux à craquelin, gluten-free. My goodness, I would never even attempt to do a choux gluten-free and they looked amazing. <laughs> This is surpri- um, okay, I won't say they're surprisingly easy, actually, because it did take a fair few um, experimentations to sort of get to that <laughs> point. But um, now, like, once you, once you crack the code, you know, then, it's, then it becomes quite simple. So, yeah, took a while, but they're good. Ah, <laughs> cracking the code. <laughs> Crackling the code, perhaps? Oh. <laughs> uh, Mal, I'm wondering how do you fit in time for things like that? Cracking the code sounds like a lot of trial and error, a lot of experimentation in the kitchen and as someone who's doing a PhD I can appreciate that (laughs) your schedule is quite hectic so could you run us through what a day in your life at home before MasterChef might have looked like in actually Uh arriving at some of the gastronomic um, creations that that you are now presenting on screen? Look I mean Procrasta baking has been a coined hashtag for a very solid reason. (laughs) Um, And my supervisor's probably going to listen to this and be like, oh, that's why she uh, needs extensions on her deadline, is it? Because she's baking. Um, No, I try and like really... (laughs) I try and set quite a regimented, you know, system so that I treat my PhD like work because I love it and that's how it should be. So I tend to try and do usually like seven or eight to two is PhD time and then afternoons, evenings, weekends are cooking and fun and, you know, general general merriment really. 
Oh, beautiful. I actually have a question for Scotty and you now. Uh-oh. This one, this one <laughs> is impromptu. What have, have either of you ever taken treats into an academic space, like to uni? Because I know, Scotty, you actually lecture. Yes. And Mel, have you ever taken treats to your advisor? Like, have you ever entered into your your life as a professional, um, like showcasing, hello, these are my baked goods, please eat them, or, or, or any other kinds of treats? <laughs> Um, Ooh, well, that's a tricky question. You go first. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, I go to, u- like my uni is in Melbourne. I go to Deakin, um, but I obviously live in Perth, oh, wow. so I don't get the chance. My supervisor does follow me on Instagram though, mm. and she's very supportive of all my cooking. Um, but oh. then over Christmas, because I was in Melbourne, we had like a little academic picnic, which was really exciting for me because I got to meet all my like, you know, academic heroes. And um, I did take shoe pastry and, you know, it was a bit of like a, please like me, take my baked goods. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at, you know, in Aww. the meantime, please like, don't ask me too much about my research because I was very much in MasterChef zone and um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was kind of struggling to bridge those two worlds. <laughs> I did learn on our, um, Elise and I did a project last year, 100 cakes in 100 days, and I learned you could post cake. So, mm-hmm. like, you, mm. you could post things. Over. I don't know whether I'd post a shoe pastry. Like, I think maybe we- that could be out of the realm of possibilities, but we did post each other cake and it made it and it was delicious. We posted love cake. <laughs> <laughs> To each other is, <laughs> because I have taken baked goods um, to uni, but it was for my um, fellow academics when we were doing marking, which just takes so long. Mm. Um, so I bought sustenance for marking. B- before we go back to our French food discussion, yes, can I can I tell you something funny? Yes, I took um, venison jerky to my military Ooh. law advisor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah. Anyway, that's all. Um, <laughs> I have to know. I don't know if, if, if it influenced my mark. <clears throat> oh, he yes. loved it. He, it was a class. So everyone that he was advising was in the class that day. And it, we only had a few group sessions like that. And he ate jerky throughout the whole class. <laughs> he was just there like gnawing and chewing and salivating because like when you were eating jerky, all you do is chew. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and he finished, he almost finished the bag. Um, anyway, thanks. Thanks, Bruce. His name was Bruce. I was reading your bio and I noticed that you've also lived overseas in both Italy and Japan, two of my favourite countries in the world. Tell me a little bit about that. That must have been an amazing experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, My family moved to Japan when I was actually two and we lived there for three years. So it was kind of like, you know, not a super long time, but very formative, you know, years. So all my, you know, earliest childhood memories are all from Japan. Um, And then we continued to have a lot to do with Japan growing up. So I, I studied Japanese all through school and uni and I also did two exchanges to Japan when I was in um, my first in primary school and then my second in high school. So I had like, yeah, a lot to do with Japan growing up Um, and then I did a year-long exchange to Italy and I lived in Milan immediately after high school. Oh, I knew we Um, were like (laughs) going to get along so well. (laughs) It was the best. (laughs) I'm definitely going to have to hit you up for um, travel tips to Japan. I've never been and it's so high on my to-do list. I really want to go. Yes. Have you got a favourite place in Japan? Oh, I mean, I'm always going to be biased towards the prefecture I grew up in, which is Nagano um, Prefecture. There's just, it's, it's beautiful. There's lots of mountains, lots of skiing or snowboarding, if that's that's your jam. And um, food, culture, it's all its all beautiful. It's the best. Yum. Oh, my God. Amazing. I did an exchange in Japan as well. This is what I mean by we're going to get along really well. Right, wow. okay. <laughs> I'm following out. Gotcha. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, you two are like twins. Mia. I really love her, Scotty. How do I adopt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, do you have a favourite Japanese food memory? Mm. Like, like um, is there something that you just think of as, oh, my God, that was a, a once-in-a-lifetime or every time you go to Japan there's something you want to eat? 
Oh, there's so many things. I actually haven't been back since I was diagnosed with celiac, though, because the sort of pandemic hit oh. the year I was supposed to go and everything. Um, so all of those memories are a little bit tainted now because it's all food I can't eat anymore. It's it's like most of most of that oh, food no. I've now figured out how to make at home. So I make my own ramen and udon noodles and, and all that kind of stuff, um, even like gyoza, which was a huge thing. My, that That's probably mm. my, my most obvious Japanese food memory is learning to make. Um, like Japanese gyoza when I was when I was a kid, and that was actually a dish that I did make on MasterChef, but we didn't get to see much of it on air um, uh, because mm. being able to make dumpling skins gluten free was something that really took a really long time. And then after I don't know I fifty bet. or sixty attempts, it was like mm. Eureka, I've done it. So that kind of oh. means, means a lot to me. <laughs> Well wow, done. there's something about that moment. I think we've all been through it in terms of perfecting a recipe and oh, yeah. making it over and over. And then when you find that sweet spot and you finally nail it, mm. it is so satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The day I nailed, the, nailed those dumpling wrappers, I think I just made like 40 or 50 of them. And my partner came home <laughs> and she was like, what is going on? And I was just like, you know, I don't know elbows deep in dumplings. No. Like, <laughs> I just had my first dumpling for like four or five years. It was a good day. It was a really good day. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you have a favorite feeling? I love that. Oh, I have so many favorite feelings. I think now that now that I can't just go to like, you know, dim sum and order everything, um, like, yeah, I started making heaps of my own. So I'm so, I, I don't like to pick my favorites. Love a pork and ginger, you know, kind of classic Ooh, yeah. kind of gyoza feeling, but then also like chicken and coriander and like prawn and mm. scallop and all that kind of stuff. Whatever I've got in the house to whip up a dumpling is a good dumpling in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to know um, if you've got any like gluten-free baking tips for us because um, I have a few friends that are gluten-free and I have hit and misses when I try and sub things out. Um, some things work well, others don't. Have you got any hot tips it's really hard to give like a one size fits all tip to be honest because so much of it depends mm. on like what what you're trying to make you know like my advice on how to convert a cake for instance is very very different um to my advice on how to convert like a tart because pastry is really hard because you know you need binders and stabilizers to provide that elasticity that you would need so that the dough is not just going to fall apart in a brittle mess um for a cake, mm. it's about balancing like moisture content more so. So, you know, if it's supposed to be a dense, rich cake, then often you can sub things like almond flour, at least with a portion of gluten-free flour, um, you know, to make it kind of work. Uh, but the f- biggest piece of advice I'd probably say is don't just try and convert from a recipe. You know, start with a gluten-free recipe, quite frankly, because the people who are doing that online um, have probably tested (laughs) and it's just going to work out better. Although if you are doing cakes, I mean, you know, let's just put aside the whole master thing for for a minute, but uh, gluten-free packet mixes are really good and I have 100% passed off a packet mix as a homemade cake and I'm not going to (laughs) lie. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I do find those pre-mixed flours um, that are gluten-free flours are quite good because they've worked out all a lot of those technical elements of getting all the right added bits and pieces in you need for the, the flour to behave like real flour. <laughs> Yeah, it really depends on the blend. There's, like, a lot of variations in there. Like, that's the problem is, like, people don't seem to realise that because every gluten-free flour you get is generally a blend of lots of flours, that they all act differently as well. Yes. So, I, you know, it's it's hard to find, you know, if you find a recipe that's just, like, three cups of gluten-free flour, it's like, well, hold on, which, which one? Because is that one that's 80% corn and 20% tapioca or 50%? rice and 40 percent you know whatever else and it just it varies a lot and it changes the flavor and you know that's that's the annoying part of gluten-free cooking unfortunately i'm wondering if at all your understanding of the cuisine has changed since meeting shannon bennett you know what was Mm. that experience like and what what were your takeaways from having met him um yeah that was that was really cool actually um i think it was a real eye-opener for us on the dessert team. Like, in those challenges, we get very bogged into what course we're working on. So I was very focused on desserts. Mm. Um, but, you know, our sort of plan originally had been, you know, the standard, like, 
throw everything but the kitchen sink on the plate and we were talking about, you know, crumbs and pralines and cakes and all this other stuff to try and, you know, I guess it's that kind of kind of modern plate of dessert vibe where you know you're supposed to hit all the textural elements and all the kind of flavor profiles and what ends up happening is often you end up having like sort of too much on a plate that even you know unless it's done really 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 well um it can just be kind of a bit mm-hmm. of a mess um so the advice we were getting was just constantly like just bring it back just bring it back so i think that day we ended up we actually plated fewer elements than we no what was it we threw out more elements than we plated because by the time we got that advice, we'd pretty much started working on almost everything because um, we, we worked really oh, well no. as a little dessert team. So it was pretty much all done. And they were like, oh, it's too much. So, oh, okay. Nix that, <laughs> nix that, that's in the bin. And it was just, um, <laughs> yeah, the final, the final version was a very, you know, what they loved about it was that it was like simplicity and refinement and it, you know, celebrated the produce. And I think that that was a real eye opener for us for sure. It looks yeah. so amazing, and I think that's such a hard thing to do, particularly in the MasterChef kitchen. I think you want to, like, show all of this technique that you've been learning and you want to put as many possible things as you can um, and to be able to just put yourself on the line and refine it back to the, the way that you did. Your dish looked beautiful, um, and it's a brave move because you've got nowhere to hide. You've only got two <laughs> or three elements, and that's it. Mm. But um, I think you did really well. I'm wondering if you could share with listeners who didn't actually watch the episode, could you run mm. down what ended up on the plate? What were the flavours? What, what, what was the composition of this dessert? Mm. Yeah, sure. So we had a really rich chocolate cremeau on, at, at the base of our dessert, um, which is quite a kind of like a glorified ganache, I guess. You make like an anglaise with, you know, like eggs and milk and cream and add it to chocolate and it makes a beautiful little, you know, what we could see was like a little puck of of this really rich custody ganache. Um, and then we had a little bit of creme fraiche on top, a pile of fresh cherries and a quenelle of cherry sorbet. Can, can I ask a question about your PhD? Now can oh, we come cool. back to the little, the children's literature? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a food podcast, however... <laughs> Um, we are food nerds and nerds being the, uh, maybe we are nerds that like food. What? <laughs> um, can I ask what, what is your, um, area of research within that particular subject matter? Mm. Uh, so I'm examining underlying ideologies in anthropomorphic picture books. Oh, what does that mean to people who have no idea what that means? Um, so <laughs> anthropomorphism is when we um, make non-human things human. So think like Thomas the Tank Engine and the Cars franchise and um, even like Toy Story where the toys come alive. Um, and my research basically looks at that phenomenon in picture books, focusing on the anthropomorphism of objects, so like not animals or plants, mm-hmm. which has been done um, There's a fair bit of research about that. Um, And I, yeah, look at what we're, you know, teaching children or how we're socialising them through that kind of format. Lots of books are doing it really well. Um, But there's, there's a lot that are, I think, yeah, children's books for the, for the average population um, does fly under the radar a lot. And Mm. because it's like, oh, it's kids books. Like, what does, what does it matter? But it's actually like, well, actually, no, these matter almost more than any other books because these teach our kids, you know, who is valued and what's important in the world. Um, They teach us everything. It really forms your, you know, basis of all your education and all your kind of knowledge about society. So it's it's really important that we look at what what we're telling them. Is there a book that you would recommend that does it really well? Like I am a huge fan of, say, Sean Tan, who, I mean, it's almost like a stereotypical choice in children's lit world because his books um, are really just works of art that can be enjoyed by kids and adults alike. And his book, Cicada, like, is, is a game changer, I reckon. I really just appreciate Ooh, I how he writes his books and they are super intensely awesome. And I read a lot and that's my favourite book, right. you know, not even just in picture book worlds, but it's actually my favourite book, so, yeah. 
are there any case studies that you've woven into your PhD that involve food? Like, is there a way that you have looked at merging your interests? I'm looking at inanimate objects being turned into characters, and a lot of the time that that is food. You know, like a donut will start to talk, and that comes into the you know under the banner of my research. Um, so I guess in that sense, sometimes food kind of makes an appearance, but for the most part, not not a whole lot. Mm. I love talking donuts. <laughs> <laughs> like, where can I buy that text for my knee size? I know she'd love it. The donuts are on their way to a party. One's wearing pink frosting, the other is chocolate. <laughs> oh, should I put sprinkles on today? I think so, <laughs> said the jam donut. <laughs> Sorry. Is this you pitching your cook your picture book to uh, potential viewers? This is viewers definitely not my children's book idea, but maybe it's another another one. All of a sudden, Sally decided to roll in in sugar flavored with cinnamon. Oh dear! She started to roll down the cinnamon sugar hill. Anyway, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not my idea. We but have I might gone on a tangent. <laughs> I um yeah once said once said children's book is in is in its uh maybe even in a draft form I might send it to you for a perusal and you can flag yeah. any um any particular <laughs> issues I should be aware of at least I don't think uh you should be including that churro um dipped in chocolate it's a little fun. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> we have gotten way off track. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Oh my, God. oh my God. Thank you so much for joining us, Mel. Thank you. You're a gorgeous human, and I can't wait to watch more of you on MasterChef. It has been um, so great to talk to you. This has been the funnest conversation. Our first guest. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm very much looking forward to meeting you in real life. So we'll have to book something in very soon. Yes. And all the best on the current season. We hope you do really well. Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Cook your heart out. Bye. Bye. Scotty, I love her. And can I tell you something? Yes. She is my dad's pick to actually win. So, really? Hot tip from go. Elise. She Hot was amazing. Tip, I could speak to her oh, yeah. all day. Me too. Absolutely. I think we have so many common interests and i am that's one of the beauties of MasterChef, the good fortune of meeting similar souls. Connecting with it. other food nerds. I love it. <laughs> meeting new people is like receiving a gift. Anyway. Yes. Oh, she's wonderful. <laughs> um, now. Speaking of that elimination, uh, oh, sorry, service challenge that yes. Mel was a part of with Shannon Bennett as the uh, guest in that episode of MasterChef, mm-hmm. Scotty, what would you have cooked in that French food service challenge? Oh, French. I, will, I would definitely be on the dessert team because I think a lot of desserts are based in French cuisine. Um, so I would have quite a few things up my sleeve, I think. Maybe a chouard craquelin. I think that is a classic French dessert. Um, you do love your shoe. I do love my <laughs> shoe. And it would have to involve custard of some description in some way. Um, but, yeah, I think that would be – they made a shoe, the favourites, like – made a lot like they made three different desserts they had a macaron they had this beautiful lemon meringue tart and they had a shoe pastry they did these little petite fours and I was a little bit nervous for them because that's the risk you want to show all this technique but the more you make the more you're giving the judges to criticize and I think the fans listened to Shannon Bennett and they you know exercised that restraint and did that beautiful dessert so yeah I think I would do that what would you do Ah, well, Scotty, I have, I can say been there, done that, because I actually <gasps> did make a French dessert on MasterChef. Oh, that's right, you yeah. did. So I made a dish that was actually inspired by an ice cream flavour that I had when mm. I was in Paris. Yes. Um, and it was a uh, prune and armagnac flavoured ice cream. So mm, my dessert fine. for the service challenge that I was in um, was a pr- 
plum and Armagnac dessert. So I chose to go for the uh, the fresh uh, plum rather than the dried prune mm. and poach the plums in a spiced Armagnac syrup and serve them on top of this really velvety, luxurious custard that just, just held on the custard. plate after piping it on the plate. Yes. Just vanilla bean custard. I remember yelling up at you on the gantry and saying, <laughs> Scotty, I'm making custard. <laughs> I remember that well. I was so yes. pleased but so disappointed. I didn't get to taste it. Mm, it was it was nice. It was nice, and that was served with a mm. uh, uh, creme fraiche sorbet and a little bit of a pistachio praline, and the judges loved it. It said that it transported Yum. them to a little bistro in the countryside of France, and I was like, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it time? I believe it's show it, and tell. Shall we tell time? Yeah, and I think you should go first again. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love show and tell. I get so excited about this. I've spent all week trying to work out what on earth I'm going to do. I've got mm-hmm. like two different things. so I'm going to allow it because I've got I- like five things. <laughs> <laughs> rules are made to be broken. Oh, my gosh. We're breaking the rules that it's episode two. We're going yeah, to get yeah, to yeah. like episode five and we're going to have like mm. ten things for show and tell. No worries. Adam also was like, how can you guys have a show and tell on a podcast? I'm like, well, we describe the things that we're showing via telling. So yes. if you are new to this segment, that's 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 what we're aspiring to do. If you would love the visual experience of this, you have to jump onto YouTube. Okay. Yes, and subscribe to our channel. Send us some love um, and you won't miss a beat in terms of all these amazing things. Yes, so yes. my first show and tell um, is like – the transformation from show and tell from um, episode one. So I sh- had for Joas from episode yes. one. And so I made this week, and then this is where I had to show you, this mm. incredible for Joa jam, unbelievable. The flavour that came out of these for oh. in this jam was insane. And I made this gorgeous little, can you see? Oh, Scotty's made this a little dessert. shortcake. <laughs> Custard shortcake. I had to put custard powder in my shortcake mm-hmm. and it makes it amazing. With a tonka bean cream and fajoa jam. Oh my and gosh. can I tell you, this is like mind blowing. The oh custard gosh. shortcake, fajoa jam is so fragrant. And then the tonka beans give this like vanilla nutmeg, like another layer of spice that just accentuates those fajoas so much. Yeah. It is divine. So if you can't um, see Scotty's dessert, it it is a dessert with a um, a top layer and a bottom layer of shortcake. So it's like a sponge but a little bit denser than a sponge. A bit denser, and yep. the thickness of, of this cake is about, what, two centimetres or mm. so? It, you've made oh, it in a sheet tray, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And... Scotty has layered the shortcake or sandwiched in between the shortcake, this Vajoa mm-hmm. jam, and some beautifully piped cream. It looks delicious. And when you come mm. to Melbourne, uh, can we make a version, please? Mm-hmm. We have to. <laughs> yes. We definitely have to. Mm. So that's my, like, just quick short show and tell. Um, so t- the, my main show and tell for today isn't mm-hmm. what's in the box. It's what's in the bag. So you, have to, you have to guess uh, mm-hmm. what's in the bag. I have a brown paper bag here. Um, mm-hmm. All right. So this brown paper bag uh, looks like it is filled with something edible. I'm I'm making this assumption because sometimes when I go to the shops, I feel things. <laughs> I feel I feel brown paper bags with little things that uh, you know look a little. Uh, odd shaped within the bag <laughs> once it is once it is filled. So um, this bag is not a large bag. It's a medium sized brown paper bag, like a sandwich bag that you would have put your tuck shop lunch in in primary school. <laughs> and uh, I'm interested to know what's inside it. What's your guess? I, I've tried to be mm. on theme. This is also in season right now. Seasonality <gasps> is really important to me. Um, so mm-hmm. these are in season right now, and they're sort of inspired by. French week, Paris week. This is slightly, I'm going to make a guess, Scotty. Now, what's in season in Melbourne is slightly different to what's in season in Queensland Mm, because you are more tropical than what I am. Um, You could still have tomatoes kicking around for all I know and we haven't had (laughs) tomatoes for months. But 
in Melbourne right now, and something that I would be putting in a brown paper bag would be chestnuts. Ooh, well, let's see what's in the bag. Oh, I can stun you. It's chestnuts. Yes. 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 <laughs> the stun you is the Italian word for chestnuts. Oh, so that's what I yes. Grew up calling them. Mm. Chestnuts. Oh. I love chestnuts. Can I tell you? In the, during MasterChef, I bought some chestnuts because they are a sort of a cold climate um, thing. Mm. We don't usually get them very often up here in Queensland. And um, during MasterChef, I found some and I wanted to just roast them in the oven to see what they'd be like. And hot tip, if you roast chestnuts in the oven just like this, they become <laughs> grenades. Like <laughs> I thought... <laughs> I was getting shot at because I threw them in the oven and in about five minutes there was just this bang and I was like, what on earth is that? And I open up the oven and it's just dust. My chestnuts turned, were just obliterated. They exploded. Oh, my God. So Scotty's roommate was Justin. Um, Was he there? Did he he know? No. Luckily, luckily. (laughs) <laughs> I just like swept the oven up and just pretended oh it never God. happened. And the fire alarm didn't go off. That's also <laughs> didn't go off. important. <laughs> We've got I a few stories. Gave me a about fry. Fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, I've got chestnuts. I don't know what to do mm. with them apart from when you put them in the oven, make sure you split them. You look, put the knife in mm. and give them a little slice so it doesn't explode and the steam can escape. Mm. <laughs> Hot tip. Oh, Tim. Do you have any recipe ideas for chestnuts? <laughs> oh, Scotty, I I just love them roasted. And I grew up with um, having Nonna and I share a, um, a tea towel filled with hot roasted chestnuts Ooh. on our laps, um, you know, in front of the TV. And we would just sit there peeling warm chestnuts. Um, my mother and... Other people in our family would would uh, have um, that experience accompanied by a little tub of butter. Ooh. <laughs> so That's very there, French. There, well, I don't know. This is, I don't know if anyone was doing this because it's a French thing, but this is what my family would do. And you would just sit there peeling chestnuts, and then you get a little bit of butter on your knife, and just you. You Ooh. put a little dollop or just a slight, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon amount of butter on each chestnut and you <laughs> eat it and it oh, just starts yum. to melt and that's that's a little combination that I enjoy <laughs> eating. Salted butter on a hot chestnut. <laughs> Yum. Um, oh, my goodness. I need people. If, if you mm. have an amazing chestnut recipe, please send it in. Um, mm. We would love to hear from you. Scotty and Elise at gmail.com. Yeah. Okay. So my show and tell, Scotty, I will be showing you... <laughs> I'm going to show two things. I'm going to pair it back. I said I had five things in front of me, but I'll be Okay, yeah, space it out, space it out. (laughs) This isn't sponsored. This is just something that I love. This is a shop that I adore. Uh, Mm. You and I, Scotty, have both received gifts from this brand in the past. The brand is Gewurz House. Oh, Um, yes. Such good spices. While I was at the Queen Victoria Market the other day, I couldn't walk away from the Gewurz <laughs> House stall without buying yeah. their French lavender salt. Okay. <gasps> oh, I love that. Um, all their herbs de Provence. Okay. <gasps> yes. And the French lavender salt, I've actually used this morning to season my porridge. Oh, yum. Yes. Lavender so, is such a fun ingredient to cook oh, with. Oh, yeah. I think and, a lot of people go, what, lavender? It Doesn't that just mm-hmm. exist in potpourri? But no, it, no, no. you can eat it. It's delicious. Absolutely. It's often a secret ingredient in French cooking I've come to learn this week, mm. actually. Oh, yeah. And it is also in Herbs de Provence as a, as a herb. Is or, it really? Would you classify mm. lavender as a herb? Oh, <sighs> probably. It's not a spice. I guess so. What else would yeah. it be? A flower, mm. yeah. So the That's lavender salt. If you're not if you're not salting your porridge, you have to salt your porridge. Like it will transform your life. Add a little pinch of salt to your porridge. Even better, add a little bit of French lavender salt. Yeah. So I have had porridge this morning okay. that I made with half uh, milk, half oat milk. And I seasoned it with a little bit of the French lavender salt while I was cooking it. And then at the end, I, I you know, drizzled honey on top. I Yum. like a dollop of Greek yogurt with my porridge, a sliced a banana, and then I sprinkled the 
French lavender salt on top so that every now and then I had this mouthful of honey that had been salted with the French lavender salt. Oh, my gosh, it was so good. Yum, yum, yum. yum. It was beautiful. The contents include flaked salt, coriander, aniseed, lavender, fennel, pepper, chilli, garlic and ginger. Oh, yum. And the herbs de Provence. Chilli, garlic and ginger. Was that in the lavender salt? Yes, you wow. can't you can't pick up pick pick it up. The predominant flavor, oh sorry, the predominant flavor is the lavender. Everything else in there is there for balance. It's just a combination that really really works well in mm. harmony. There's nothing there that's overpowering. It's a lavender salt first and foremost. Yum. Mm. The herbs de Provence um, do not usually come in this large jar that I bought the other day. Um, mm. So it doesn't have a list of the ingredients, but I can tell you that I've bought this to make this beautiful fish dish um, that I had when I was traveling. And I had fish with uh, this, um, I suppose, tomato based herb de Provence sauce almost anywhere I ate if it was on the menu. Um, if the menu du jour was fish with tomatoes and herbs de Provence, I ordered it because it's one of my favourite types of, you know, lunches that could exist Yum. in the world. Yes. Oh, I love <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. So there are my two things, Scotty Bagnall. Oh, that's it. I love it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Very French. I love this. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. good. Now, our next segment today is a little mm. book club segment. Yes. And yes. I went down to uh, Books for Cooks, um, which is located at the Queen Victoria Market. And it's an was amazing very, very fortunate. Store. Yes, it is. If you haven't been and you're a food person and a bookish person, you must go. But leave your oh. wallet at home. Like, it will be terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take, take the amount of cash that you can limit yourself with spending. Yeah. And, um, Sorry. Set a limit prior to entry. Uh, <laughs> If, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see my bookshelf behind me and you could just imagine mm. um, how many of those books were acquired at Books for Cooks. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the reasons I love this place is because Tim and Amanda um, know absolutely everything about their shop and, and the contents they're in. Mm-hmm. If you have a question about a book or if you have an inquiry, um, they will answer it and more. Mm-hmm. And during MasterChef, whenever I had random requests, <laughs> they went above and beyond. And I had suspicions that they might have suspected that I was a contestant on MasterChef <laughs> because who else would go in and say, where are all of your books on Native Australian ingredients and can I buy them all? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I went in and asked them about their French cookbook s- selection and Tim went above and beyond to explain that this question was loaded with, well, do you want books on provincial French cooking? Do you want books on nouveau cuisine? And I now think about French cuisine as much more than just butter because of that conversation mm-hmm. and you know it's it's taken that inquiry to come to this realization so i've recorded my chat with tim and excellent uh, i'm looking forward to you listening scotty amazing i want to know if i need to add more french cookbooks to my life oh we probably both do <laughs> <laughs> and i did indeed after this meeting let me tell oh. you <laughs> <laughs> okay Let's listen. Let's listen. So, French cookbooks. Well, the first question is, what sort does French cooking mean to you? Um, some people think it's fine dining, um, just the fancy Michelin three-star restaurants. Uh, there's a completely different way of presenting. The technique underneath is um, classic French. It's drawn from the great chefs over the decades and centuries, and it's refined, and now it's pretty much the way it's taught. So, something like professional chef which this is an american book but every textbook and this is one of the better ones um is structured on escoffier carem um two great uh chefs teaching in the 18th 19th and early 20th century and it's all the same method you learn your sources you learn your knife skills and you work your way forward so for some people that's a way that they like to learn french cooking and if they wanted to do that without the, the course then definitely I would suggest to you 
the Time Life Good Cook series. Um, there's 28 of these. Uh, oh one God, for each you got um, it. <laughs> uh, subject that you can think of. So it goes from beef and veal to terrines, patisserie and confectionery to salads and hors d'oeuvres. And the front half is all classic pre-nouvelle cuisine technique. So you get lots of step-by-step -step how to do the old school stuff. And then the back half are recipes. They go beyond French, but they use French ideas and techniques. So all of those fancy moulds and terrines, etc., they're well explained in here. And it's in metric, so it's quite, quite sensible. But if you don't want to do a course, then some people, it's, they just want to you know, have what they normally have in their local French restaurant, which is bistro cooking, and it's Parisian. It's the sort of food that you um, would associate with steak frites and some oysters, maybe some uh, raw bar or some smoked salmon or something like that. And then there would be a, a green salad and, and, of course, chocolate mousse for dessert and a rum bar bar or something like that. There's many, many cookbooks, and, and the recipes are pretty standard. And it's finding one that's got the pictures and a voice that you like. So a, a good Australian alternative, if I can slide it out, um, or option, would be something like Menu. Menu. Eat this sort of food, he cooks really well. And these are well authored and well published. Oh, so it means they're tested and they have so good um, language and measurements. And if you were to flick through, all of these dishes would be things that you would be happy to have, you know, on a, on a Friday night, not too fancy sort of dinner. Um, so there's there's many options if you wanted to go that way. Um, then you've got cuisine bourgeois, which is sort of the middle class cooking of France that's not in a restaurant. And that's where it starts to get really tricky because it overlaps with regional cooking and what we think of as being uh, from specific areas with tradition and history. And so... If, you, if you're thinking just cuisine bourgeois, it's the middle class sort of food that you would eat, not in a restaurant. And classic authors would be someone like Julia Childs, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Uh, that's volume two, um, because of the film we keep selling out of volume one. Um, but this has all of those. Um, a young girl goes off to catering school to learn how to cook for the family type sort of food. Um, it's, it's not romantic. It's a manual how-to, it's precise, didactic, exemplary. I mean, it's just staggering work, but it's not going to fill you with love uh, of going to a particular place. Um, the book that Julia worked on, or started with, this is the book that Julia started with, Madame Solange. Um, this was the bestseller in France from about 8, uh, 1910, 1920 to about 1950. And she was also a journalist and she wrote for um, her husband's uh, culinary magazine and so found out recipes every, every week um, for almost 30 years. Um, if you want to make a beef bourguignon, the recipe in here will be great. The recipe in the beef version of this will be great. The recipe in here will be 10 times longer. The detail is just extraordinary. There is an English edition, but it's not common. It turns up occasionally. But um, it's super dense and super detailed. This one's from the 1930s. No. So this is what middle class households would have been cooking from. And there again, there are many others. Uh, Jeanette Mathieu is a um, well known, and if you know your Faden cookbooks, um, the French cookbook that they've done, that's her main book that came out in the 1930s. Every publisher competed and tried to have something similar. So there's many great authors that I'd recommend. Then you've got um, the regional cookbooks, and that starts to get really tricky because there are two distinct trends. The first is an exhaustive one, and that's still probably one of the best ones. France the Beautiful from Weldon Owen is also really good, but Anne Willen has run a cooking school in Burgundy for, it must be 40 years, maybe 45, um, and uh, is in a chateau. Her husband has the world's largest collection of pre-19th century cookbooks ever. Um, it's, his collection is extraordinary, but this is authoritative and it dips into each of the regions and gives you the top 10, 15 dishes for each region that are purely traditional. Some of them have been adopted into mainstream cuisine and some of them are just 
only in the regions. In the same way that you get that in Italy, you know, some dishes never go to the north and never go to the south. In France, the big divide is the cooking fat. So in the north, it's butter, and in the west, it's um, uh, goose fat, and in the south uh, east, it's olive oil. And that's the main divide. And if you look at France topographically, it's the same way. Um, the mountains in the, men in the middle divide it all up. Um, so you, you'll see that dishes that are Provençal rarely make it into a Parisian or a Brittany style menu. Uh, dishes from the southwest are rarely found in Alsace. But it does mean that you do get great regional statements. So something like this is a new one. Alex Jackson's done a great book on Provençal food. So a very Mediterranean, olive oil, lots of vegetables, lots of fish. Um, that's really lovely. Um, we also really like, and Provence is, I think, closest to Australia in the sense that our climate suits it. Um, in Melbourne and Adelaide, it's, it's wine friendly, it's sunny, lots of vegetables. Only, I think, one of the great French cookbook authors, but very few people know about it. But people would go and do pilgrimages to his house in Provence in the 1980s and 90s. Um, so that's an excellent one. And then you've got something like in the same vein, Stephanie Alexander doing this cooking and travelling in southwest France, which is modelled on Paula Wolfert's cooking and travelling in southwest France. Um, an excellent examination of goose um, and uh, Gascony, Armagnac, Cognac. Um, all sorts of lovely, Scotty. what we think of as wintry foods, yeah. but also um, oh, uh, cassoulet, uh, the giant this. bean, uh, duck, wow. casserole, for want of a better word. Um, so you get lots of regional. And then France also gets cut by Nouvelle Cuisine. So in yes, the same way that uh, food generally has had major trends worldwide. France had this big epiphany in about 1980 when all the top chefs turned around and said, we are not cooking the old way. We're not going to do um, all of these fancy sauces and the names that no one knew. Um, we're going to keep it simple. And Nouvelle Cuisine came about and the plates were all minimalist. They were very heavily influenced by Japanese design. Uh, and you end up some really weird, geometric, ugly sort of things and avocado and squid ink appear everywhere. But nevertheless... <laughs> The sauces are much lighter, and all of a sudden we're using jus, not sauces, and we don't have a sauce here with a big station in the kitchen. We have food that actually can be replicated a lot more easily at home. Um, and so many of the modern sort of French books um, or French-style books are like that. Um, there's a, a really good one um, that's uh, put out by one of the New York journalists, um, and it's uh, Dinner in French, and it's, it's not... There's not one story of finding a recipe in France or whatever, but every thing you flick through, you'll go, oh, that's so French, that's so French. And it's it's not regional, it's just on, on point and on style. So for contemporary, that's really good. But then there are classics, and there are books that I think you always ought to have. Julia Child, of course, everyone's heard of it, everyone's got it. It's not going to be the sort of book that's going to make you sit up in bed and... and Ooh, and think about travelling to France. For me, I would put Elizabeth David at the top of that pile. Now, Elizabeth is no longer with us, a British author who um, helped the British rediscover the Mediterranean and Europe um, after World War II. And her first two books were evocative um, and they called for gallons of olive oil at a time when you could only buy um, at the chemist in, in um, half ounce vials so it was almost like fantasy cooking for um, people on rations uh, but it did uh, inspire people to travel and, it, and um, she was for example one of the first to reintroduce Le Creuset back into, into London um, and all of these are brilliant at different levels her early books are really accessible and easy if you need precision no but if you're comfortable just winging it and she says a wine glass of this and a smidgen of that and you love to taste as you cook, then her books will be um, open so many doors. You'll find so many lovely things, plus a really lovely literary prose. Um, following on from her, I think in the 1980s there was a real re-examination of the way in which the West um, looked at French cooking and 
at the head of that was Julia, after her big tomes, wanted to do more and she started doing her TV. Um, we had other authors and one of them, not well known in Australia, is Richard Olney. So um, he was a, an expat living in the south of France and he had uh, the distinction of being um, an American in Paris writing for magazines as the esteemed food and wine writer uh, and knighted by the French government at least once, I think twice, uh, who was also commissioned to write the official biographies of Chateau Yuquem and Domaine Romani Conti, the two greatest wines in France, arguably. Um, when this book came out, it was like a um, landmine went off in fine dining restaurants because chefs like Alice Waters at Chez Panis instantly found their centre, what they really wanted to cook, and that was seasonal, local produce that might be complex, might be simple, but it was honest and it reflected um, what we now call a sense of terroir, of place. And so his book came out, and he actually wrote some of the early menus at Chez Panisse. Um, he was instrumental in um, establishing Simon Hopkinson uh, as a great chef in London. Um, Simon was heavily inspired by the sort of dishes that Richard only showed him. And Richard was actually the general editor of this. Um, he did all 27 volumes, so the hands in there are mostly his, not mine. Um, this is his first one. There's also another one, A Book of Simple Food. Um, but if you're interested in books that don't have pictures, then I would strongly recommend those last ones. Thank you, Tim. Wow. He is <laughs> Never too much. So knowledgeable. <laughs> oh. ah, that is insane. One of He's... my favourite brains I've ever met, I think. I agree. I agree. And what a job. I think that could be my dream job, owning a, cook, a cookbook store. So after that particular visit to Books for Cooks, Scotty. How much damage uh, did you do? Did you set a budget before you went is my first question. I didn't set a budget. <laughs> <laughs> oh no Adam my partner oh, Adam if you're listening um, stop listening now <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do Scotty when I go to Books for Cooks I um, leave my bags in the car if Adam's home when I get home and I don't bring them into the house until he's out of the house and I put the book straight into the bookshelf before he notices because <laughs> he doesn't do that. know I try and do that too, but somehow Andrew can spot it. I don't know how, <laughs> but he'll be like, that book looks new. I'll be mm. like, no. Yeah, no. Adam has no idea. And I tend to rearrange uh, things as well, so it keeps things fresh. Maybe I need to do that. <laughs> Keep Andrew on his toes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what did you buy? What did you buy? I bought seven things. Seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for, the, for the purpose of this podcast, I will share with you what is relevant within the ambit of French cuisine. Yes. So, um, as I mentioned, I purchased Lulu's Provincial Table. I just uh, love the cover of that one. Mm. It is beautiful. So this is written by the Richard Olney, foreword by Alice Waters. Um, Tim knows that I'm absolutely obsessed with Chez Panisse and um, the Zuni Cafe, um, these American restaurants that really led the way when it comes to um, farm-to-table dining and mm. seasonal eats within um, the US. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm adding, adding to that particular collection with this one. And... I purchased the Elizabeth David text, French Provincial Cooking. Now, Ooh. I love Elizabeth David. Her writing is the kind of writing that I love to take to bed. This is, yes. this is a cookbook that you can just pick it up, open at any point and enjoy the reading of it. And it will oh, inspire you to perhaps cook from this text. However... Um, you know, there aren't any pictures if you're someone that has to have a cookbook with pictures and you're not someone that reads cookbooks. Um, you know, it might not be the cookbook for you. However, it's the cookbook for me. <laughs> 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 um, I w I'm actually going to read a passage of this to you soon, Scotty. Oh, and, beautiful. Um, I'll show you what else I purchased. I purchased fish and shellfish. So this is one of the texts that are a part of that larger collection of works that Tim was mentioning. Mm. And the reason I purchased this is because it's quite an expensive book. It's a very old text, as you can see. You might be thinking, oh, that's a bit retro. Why did she very buy retro. that? <laughs> um, 
within this text are excellent imagery um, or within the text is excellent imagery of um, the stages of cooking particular dishes and this is a text that showcases technique in words and and photographs. Um, I love that. And there's always a place for classic cuisine on my bookshelf. So um, regardless of the era that this text has been published, um, I think it is a gorgeous book. And um, the techniques, the food within this are largely timeless. There might be some terrines and, or jellies that I will definitely never make. However, <laughs> there are some beautiful um, seafood dishes within this. The text is called Fish and Shellfish um, that I will definitely be ma- making. Um, Mm. And perhaps I'll be able to use these um, herbs de Provence as well within oh, yes. within one of these dishes. Um, Scotty, I would love to share with you a passage from Elizabeth David's book. Yes, please. And um, I'm actually going to read her Beef Bourguignon recipe. Beef à la Bourguignon. Beef stew with red wine, onions and mushrooms. This is a favourite among those carefully composed, slowly cooked dishes, which are the domain of French housewives and owner cooks of modest restaurants, rather than of professional chefs. Generally supposed to be of Burgundian origin, although Alfred Contour's Cuisine à Bourguignon gives no recipe for it, beef à la Bourguignon has long been a nationally popular French dish and is often referred to or written down on menus simply as Bourguignon. Such dishes do not, of course, have a rigid formula, each cook interpreting it according to her taste. And the following recipe is just one version. Incidentally, when I helped in a soup kitchen in France many years ago, this was the dish for feast days and holidays. Two pounds of topside beef. Four ounces of salt pork or streaky bacon, unsmoked for preference. A large onion, thyme, parsley and bay leaves. A quarter of a pint of red wine. Two tablespoons of olive oil. Half a pint of meat stock, preferably veal. A clove of garlic. One tablespoon of flour. Meat dripping. For the garnish, half a pound of small mushrooms. A dozen or so small whole onions. Cut the meat into slices about two and a half inches square and a quarter of an inch thick. Put them into a china or earthenware dish, seasoned with salt and pepper, covered with a large sliced onion, herbs, olive oil and red wine. Leave to marinate from three to six hours. Put a good tablespoon of beef dripping into a heavy stewing pan of about four pints capacity. In this, melt the salt pork or bacon, cut into a quarter of an inch thick match length strips. Add the whole peeled small onions and let them brown turning them over frequently and keeping the heat low. Take out the bacon when its fat becomes transparent and remove the onions when they are nicely coloured. Set them aside with the bacon. Now, put into the fat the drained and dried pieces of meat and brown them quickly on each side. Sprinkle them with flour, shaking the pan so that the flour amalgamates with the fat and absorbs it. Pour over the strained marinade. Let it bubble half a minute. Add the stock. Put in a clove of garlic and a bouquet of thyme, parsley and bay leaf tied with a thread. Cover the pan with a closed fitting lid, with a close fitting lid and let it barely simmer on top of the stove for about two hours. Now add the bacon and onions and the whole mushrooms washed but not peeled and already cooked in butter or dripping for a minute or so to rid them of some of their moisture. Cook the stew another half hour. Remove the bouquet and garlic before serving. There should be enough for four to six people. If more convenient, the first two hours cooking can be done in advance. The stew left to cool and the fat removed. It can then be reheated gently with the bacon, mushrooms and onions added. There are those who maintain that the dish is improved by being heated up a second time. The meat has time to mature, as it were, in the sauce. To make a cheaper dish, Chuck shoulder beef may be used instead of topside and an extra 45 minutes cooking time allowed. And when really small onions are not available, it is simply best to cook a chopped onion or two with the stew and to leave the onions out of the garnish because large ones are not suitable for the purpose. For formal occasions, a bone joint of beef may be cooked whole and served with a similar sauce and garnish and then becomes piece de bouffe à la bourguignon. Oh my God, I love it. (laughs) 
Isn't it gorgeous? And the detail. Oh, oh. I could just, I'm there, right beside them, making mm-hmm. it. And the pronoun her. Oh, yes. When, ref- when, it, when she refers to her yes. taste. Oh, yes. Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah. This is good food writing. Mm. <sighs> so, Scotty Bagnall. Yes. Is there a particular text that you would like to share? So today I'm going to be reading from this beautiful book, French Food Unbound, um, written by Katrina Manik. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but this is such a gorgeous cookbook. And I think um, it really spoke to me because this idea of French food unbound, um, I think like we've spoken about some of the traditional French food um, is very classic, but I really enjoy modern food. So I'm interested. I was really interested. I went down the rabbit hole in terms of modern gastronomy um, to see if there was something that would tickle my fancy. Um, and this book is all about bistronomy. Um, so it talks about the revolution from traditional French techniques into the French bistro cooking. Um, And I found it really, really interesting. She's an amazing writer. Um, Even just the little Ford at the start of the cookbook is divine. Um, There's this little Ford message here. And it says, For chefs and the way they use their hearts, hands and minds as cooks, chemists, physicists, and cultural historians to feed our bellies and our souls. Thank you. And I just loved that passage. It really, really spoke to me. Um, and it goes into great detail. There's a, there's a pie chart um, which talks about the autonomy of bistronomy um, and the reason why this um, revolt happened from traditional French cooking into something that was more affordable and that people could relate to and is regional, but sort of breaks out some of those rules. So she was given a grant by the Cultural Institute of America to go to France and write this cookbook um, on bistronomy. And so what an amazing job that is. I need to look up that grant. <laughs> Me too. (laughs) Um, But she talks about heading to Paris um, and eating her way through Paris. And I'm just going to read this little um, paragraph here, which is about her sort of journey through discovery of bistronomy. What fascinated me were the glimpses of wine bars in alleyways, forgotten corner shops turned restaurants, and the attraction of nameless locales as tiny hubs of food and wine. It wasn't dining in Paris. The formality, the sense of pomp and circumstance in eating in restaurants, the sort of constipated churches of haute cuisine where good conversations go to die, suddenly seemed peripheral to this new style of dining. Top-notch cooking prepared with a haute cuisine touch had several fun, relaxed surrounds. It was enthralling to feel the undercurrents of culinary revolt, that sticking it to the man mentality that continues to bubble deliciously and ever so subtly under everything these chefs are doing. The meals, holy hell the meals, they were so good. Gutsy, honest, often unexpected. Food that ranged from beautifully sophisticated to dishes as homely as a dent in the couch. Dishes as decorative as modern art and as neckable as a packet of chips. And I could actually afford to eat them, even more than once. I cannot remember consuming food that prompted so many actual physical responses. My face pursed like a cat's bum at the sharp kick of fresh pungent horseradish grated over the top of gloriously marbled wagyu rump cooked over the coals or the unexpected sourness of a citrus sorbet and whey ice cream dessert. They were groans of horny delight as a light as air waffle with artichoke heart cream whipped in submission and topped with delicate shavings of hamon before murmuring over and prodding the duck dish that was earthy, piquant, meaty, wobbly, crunchy and fatty all of those textures in a few mere mouthfuls, all before eating the sort 
of thick, indulgent and creamy rice pudding that I'd only ever dreamed of. To watch, watch me was probably indecent, but here I was suddenly experiencing the holy grail of food in a city I'd read about as a culinary student and the city I had dreamed about as a romantic, waiting to be swept off my feet. I would never be full. I just love that. <laughs> so romantic. It is just amazing. So she talks about this journey of discovering all these restaurants and where this idea of bistronomy came from and um, the moving of the culinary world where French cuisine um, and gastronomy was born in France and that time and then the shift of where that moves on to and it mm. shifted into Spain and then Nordic cuisine sort of heroed this um, gastronomic journey um, and this sort of pairing back um, to good food and ingredients and provenance and all of these beautiful dishes um, and the recipes in this book are just stunning. <gasps> wow. What a beautiful passage. Thank you, Scotty. Oh, it's amazing. I definitely recommend the book. Mm -hmm. I love that we both chose female writers who write with, with romance, that write with an attention mm. to the detail within food to be so evocative and consoling. Yes. Um, I believe Elizabeth does that as well. And just, oh, my, my favourite thing about the passage that I read about Elizabeth or in within Elizabeth's text uh, would be the suggestions at the end of her recipe. Um, yes. You know, about what to do with your leftovers, about how you can uh, change the recipe up just a little bit to make something completely different, but still at the heart the same. And um, I know I will be experimenting with a piece a la bouffe, a la bouffe bourguignon. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go to a butcher who will give me an entire um, shin of beef, I think. Yes. <laughs> mm, not cut oh up into osobuk or just, you know, the whole shin. That's exactly what Yum. I mean. Mm. Yes, and we would love to know your cookbook suggestions. If you've got an amazing French cookbook, please send it our way. Tell us about it um, because it's something I realise I don't have a lot of French cookbooks mm. and there are some beautiful ones out there. So we'd love to know from you what's your favourite French thing to cook. Maybe you can give us some hot tips on French pronunciations because we're pretty bad oh. at it. <laughs> yeah, please send us some voice recordings on Instagram. You can find me on um, at least underscore food person and you can find Scotty <laughs> at SS Bagnell. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to hear from you and, you know, let us know um, what topics we should be talking about next as well. I mm -hmm. think um, this has been a great topic. I had a, a wonderful message from our loyal listener this week, um, Sasha, who was wanting to know about top tips for fridge sharing in shared accommodation. How do you go about sharing the fridge? And I thought that was a really super interesting question. I've been lucky enough. I haven't lived in a share house accommodation before. I've always just lived with myself or my partner. Um, and so I haven't really experienced that until MasterChef. <laughs> I did have to share with Justin was my roomie on MasterChef and our approach to the fridge was vastly different. So we had many conversations about fridge management. Mm. <laughs> um, so if you've got any top tips on that, have you ever had any uh, bad fridge sharing experiences? Oh, look, I've never lived in a a share house either, Scotty. Um, I've just lived with my romantic partners in life. And <laughs> in, in those instances, I've largely been the person in control of the contents of the fridge. Yes. Uh, but yes, MasterChef uh, was an experience of, of sharing a fridge with another foodie. And uh, my first roommate was Therese and she was a fantastic um, uh, fridge sharer. <laughs> uh, almost everything was labelled. Uh, I knew exactly what was in every container and um, she set that benchmark and I followed suit. Uh, I love that. All of the containers had a little bit of masking tape with a date and, and um, the contents therein described. And then I lived with Depinda and I dropped the ball. Um, when I moved in, I remember I pretty much rearranged everything because I couldn't identify any systems. Oh, <laughs> <Dependa>. no. <laughs> 
Um, but I, I definitely annoyed her with the, the, the things that I would hoard in the fridge and, um, you know, I apologize then and I apologize now. I'm sorry. But I, I did go to the effort on Saturday mornings to wake up particularly early, clean out the fridge just before I would go and help out with the Coles order to, to repack our fridge for the week. So, um, oh gosh, I'm I tried fridge- my best. <laughs> I'm a fridge hoarder. I like I like to keep things. I don't like to throw stuff out. I like to see how they taste the next day and then use it for something else. And I end up with just a whole lot of stuff in the fridge. And um, Justin was very much a just um, having a clear fridge space, mm. um, clear fridge, clear um, train of thought. And it's not how I operated. Um, so yeah, <laughs> if you have any fridge tips, um, mm. how do you share the fridge? Are you the, the foodie in the house or the non-foodie? And you know, how do you divvy up gourmet ingredients versus um, basic staples if you're not a foodie? How does that work? Any top mm. tips for sharing your fridge? We'd love yes, to hear from yes, you. Yes, please let us know. Um, we can be contacted via email and our email address is scottyandelise at gmail.com. Amazing. Thank you everyone for tuning in for our second podcast. Tune in next week for more thoughts, tips and tricks with, with guest, guest recipes, recipes and more, <laughs> and more in the mix. In the mix. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Cream, Eggs and Jam. I'm Elise Pulbrook and you can find me on Instagram at Elise underscore food person. And I'm Scott Bagnall and you can find me on Instagram at SS Bagnall like to send us your show and tell you can email us scotty and elise at gmail.com or if you'd like the visual experience of this podcast you can find us on youtube at cream eggs and jam have a great day happy baking